summoned through the dimension of sound. People explore the musical world which they believe to be true. But there is a world unheard by some that is filled with stories of an unknown reality, a jazz side. Episode 5 of Tales from the Jazz Side is with electric bassist, composer, producer, arranger, Mark Egan. All right, now this episode, I'm back on my Michael Frank's 20-year anniversary tribute. You know, as I do each of these shows, I'm beginning to notice an interesting pattern. And it's come to my attention that with each guest that I've had on the show, each one has demonstrated an unconditional love for what they do and this amazing determination to overcome any obstacle that arises in their career. And keeping with this spirit, today you will hear from a musician who's worked with many, many musicians. Now, I've not played with Mark Egan for years and years, and we don't have the road stories going back decades, But we do go back far enough for me to say what a pleasure it is to work with him whenever we do have him as a special guest with Michael Franks. And now, admittedly, I didn't know the entire history of Mark. And as I do with all of my guests, I get to researching so that I cannot sound oblivious when I'm interviewing them. And interestingly, there were large segments of history that I didn't know about him. For example, I didn't realize the scope of people and different fields of music art that he's worked in and or with people that he's worked with. And what I mean by this is that, for example, you have this one side, which is, you know, you've got Sting. He's worked with Sting, Roger Daltrey, Marianne Faithful, And then you, you're moving along another spectrum and you've got the Gil Evans Orchestra. You've got Pat Metheny Group, David Sanborn. And then you keep going and now you have his musical contributions to movies such as Aladdin or The Color of Money, television like the NBC Sports and that uh, famous CNN headline news that uh, is Mark. Okay, and... After finding out about these segments of his career, to say that I understand why he's considered to be the most respected and in-demand electric bassist on the music scene today, to me is somewhat of an understatement because I feel I understand it on an even deeper level because I've had the learning experience of seeing Mark Egan in action, of, of playing with him. And and in hearing how he contributes to the music in an almost almost unassuming way, yet his sound being so essential to each song's life and longevity, it's it's really remarkable to hear the sound that he creates with his fretless bass. He is distinctive and he is versatile, and his love of music has always been his compass for seeking out new sounds and finding and playing with kindred souls. That makes for an artist who loves the process of creating with other artists. And that's something I feel as a musician is always great to be a part of. Okay. To find out more about the wonderful and amazing Mr. Mark Egan, you can surf the web. And you can also visit his website at www.markegan.com. So join me now on Tales from the Jazz Side with my guest, Mark Egan. My guest today is electric bassist, composer, producer, Mark Egan. Hi, Mark. Hello, Veronica. Uh, Thank you so much for doing the show today. Thank you so much for having me on the show. It's a real pleasure here in Las Vegas. I know. I was just going to say that we're in Las Vegas looking at the yep. the hills and all the really dry, dry lands. Um, you know, Michael uh, introduces you as a special guest uh, now when, when you're on the show. But yeah. you guys have a history that goes further back than that. I think... Um, 
1987, or is it further back than that? I know with Cameron Never Lies, you had such great playing on that. So. It was actually earlier, I think 1981 or 82, 83. But uh, we even go further back because we did uh, co-billings with Pat Metheny Group okay. in the 70s, mm -hmm. late 70s. That's where I first met Michael. And I think we might have played in the early 80s, earlier, I think. Oh, okay. Yeah, because yep. we're going to get into some of that uh, as... Uh, as time goes on. Now, I don't really know you as well or as long as the relationship you have with Michael. And uh, I do do know, though, we tend to have, uh, uh, when we're on the plane together, either our aisle seats are across from each other. Or, yes, or, we right, like those aisle seats. Right, right or from me too. I love, I love aisle, yes. <laughs> aisle seats. Um, but um, in preparation for doing this show, I did my usual research. You know, I go really deeply into it. And, Mm -hmm. And one of the things, and I have to say it now, that, um, you know, I'm not only blown away by uh, your unparalleled musicianship, oh. uh, which is my benefit because I get to hear it and see you live, you know, well. um, but, uh, and it's absolutely amazing. It's amazing what you do. Okay. Um, but the degree um, in, and, and the weight of your body of work. I mean, it's 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 extensive, and you know, I, I actually I could say safely say that um, you have played on every album ever made, <laughs> <laughs> right? No, like you, not quite, <laughs> right? You and the drummer Buddy Williams, you guys oh, are on yes. every single yes. album ever, ever. Dear Buddy <laughs> Williams. Um, well, you know, the thing that is is interesting to me about that is. Um, how is that? How I mean, because you have such a huge body of work, and you are on, mm -hmm. uh, like you know, with Michael Franks, Pat Metheny, you just mentioned mm -hmm. Elements, which is an, a whole experimental type of of music you're doing. Duran Duran, Roger Daw. I mean, it's it just spans this whole unique, uh, uh, different genres. How mm -hmm. how is that? How do you, you know? I mean, I know uh, people give you calls and stuff, and you go out, but how how did that happen for you? Um, well, you know, Veronica, I came to New York in 1976. Um, I'm a baby boomer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I was exposed in my uh, upbringing to a lot of different styles of music, not only jazz, but rock and funk and African and Indian and uh, all different styles. So um, I've drawn from all those different styles and I'm attracted to play in a lot of different areas of music. So when I came to New York... Um, it was a wide open palette. I just wanted to play with whoever I could play with that was playing great music. And, um, you know, my first uh, gig in when I came to New York was with Diodato, and, and then that led to the Pointer Sisters, led to David Sanborn. So playing with all those players, especially in New York. New York is a very special place, as you know. And um, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a melting pot, <laughs> and you meet a lot of people, and this, you make a lot of contacts. And if you... I think if you're a, a good player and have a good attitude that you can be exposed to a lot of music and record and play with a lot of different people, you know, and so that was always my goal. I've just gone for it my whole life. Wow. I've gone for the creative music and in whatever style that is. And so I met a lot of producers and a lot of contractors and, and great musicians like Michael Franks and Pat Metheny. But for instance, I met Michael when we played with Pat Metheny on the road. And oh, then okay. Then we, I started playing and doing some recording with Michael, and then oh. working with Michael and playing with different uh, producers, Michael Kalina and mm -hmm. Rob Mounsey, and all those people do records, and and yeah. y your name gets circulated, and you yeah. become um, a friend to people, and people call you to work with them. So that's you know, that's yeah. it. And I've always risen to the occasion and done a lot of homework um, for all the different gigs that there is you know I remember the first gig I did with Diodato I went out and bought all his records and I transcribed every song and I played along with it until I knew it before I even went out so I've always had that um it could be a fear of not being able to do it you know which we'll get to <laughs> right 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 that's true you know it's interesting because uh, uh Jay Anderson was on the show and he talked about being really prepared so mm -hmm. I you know and it seems like the more prepared you are the more as a professional you tend to work more I mean it seems that way yes people um, want to play with you if you're good yeah yeah and to get good you have to do a lot of hard work there's no easy way people are can be very talented but mm -hmm. to really 
be good, you have to go in really deeply and, and spend time and work. Wow, that's, that's really true. And uh, I don't want you to worry because, um, you know, as I tell all my guests, uh, I do a little pre-taping uh, before the show so I don't embarrass you with my oh. fawning and my over the top <laughs> fra- you know, thing of your skills and so i'm Thank only you. gonna you know e- extol just a little bit of your virtues and how great you are just sitting here a little bit i won't overdo oh, it i won't embarrass you. you i appreciate <laughs> it <laughs> um you know you're known for your distinctive fretless sound and um you know when i think about your playing it's 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 gorgeous it's got this real pleasing warm sound to it and you get that when you play the electric bass and a lot of times with me ele- I'm not a great fan of electric basses because mm-hmm. they have more of a uh, uh, not a, a an, auth- uh, uh, an acoustical kind of sound but you you're able to get that in there um, and I know that you studied with the late great Jaco Pastorius yes. but you started on trumpet Yes. And so what I want to, uh, there's a couple of questions here. So I want to know what made you decide to be a bass player and also go toward the fretless bass? Mm-hmm. Well, I would have to take it all the way back to the fourth or third grade, actually, when I started taking guitar lessons. But then I, in the fourth grade, in music, in school, they just came around and asked what instrument you want to play. And I, the trumpet seemed like a nice instrument. My father had been a trumpet player in the Navy. Wow. Band and so I got a trumpet and I started playing and and you know it's one thing I remember how um, or I know how important it is for parents to be supportive of their children to with music but yeah. I can remember practicing trumpet and playing a tisket a tasket <laughs> while my mother was ironing clothes and she would say oh Mark that's so nice <laughs> and I I knew then that it wasn't good I <laughs> it's it sounded awful to me. I said, no, mom, it's not good. You know, I was, I wanted it to be better even then, you know. (laughs) So, but it was so important that they, she gave me that nurturing and everything. And and that was all through my childhood with my parents. They were very supportive. My father used to take me, I grew up in Brockton, Massachusetts. Okay. So my father used to take me to see um, the Brockton stage band, which to me seemed like Maynard Ferguson's (laughs) band, but it was just high school kids. (laughs) But I was, I was only 12 years old. Right. So, but I, there was that influence but at that same time that was in the early 60s the music that was on the radio was Jimi Hendrix okay, on right. pop radio that's right that's right and all the motown music and for some reason when i listened to the radio when i got my license and was driving the car around <laughs> i related to bass and i started really focusing in on bass lines and i went out and i bought a bass uh, just because i wanted to play oh. bass as well but i was really at 15 I was a professional trumpet player I was playing in soul bands all oh, around okay. uh, the Boston area wow in the horn bands you know doing y- steps yeah, yeah, yeah. twirling the <laughs> yeah, trumpet <laughs> and, and staying out really late uh, and telling my parents I was playing at a Knights of Columbus Hall meanwhile I was in Boston at a strip club my father and mother wanted to come and see me play I said no 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 this isn't the right one and they finally they came to this place in Boston it's called the monkey jungle or something and it was it was a strip thing and I was uh, my father loved it but right, of course yeah but your mom was like was she supportive then still yeah, they were yeah, they were because they trusted me you know yeah. I, I didn't mess up but so I started playing bass around the same time and I started taking lessons with a uh guitar teacher who was right down the hall from my trumpet teacher okay and I his name was Mike Lally and he, sh- he put me right in the right place with scales and using all four fingers in the left hand oh, and okay okay and I applied a lot of my trumpet knowledge but you know fast forward a little bit when I graduated I went to the University of Miami mm-hmm. a- to study music and I went as a trumpet player oh okay and I got accepted there and I brought my bass with me because I just like to play it yeah and um one thing led to another in my second year at the university someone called uh, a friend of mine and said I need a bass player for tonight and they said well Mark plays bass <laughs> but it was the great imposter theory <laughs> because I had a bass and I could play and right. I had been I could play tunes and everything on trumpet I was a, a jazz player on right. trumpet and right, I was in okay. the first jazz band playing yeah, second well, trumpet you know playing the jazz chair so mm-hmm. I talked to the guy and he sa- he said can you do it? And I said, well, what tunes are you doing? And he said, gave me a list of the songs. So I scrambled all day 
<laughs> just and I knew all the songs on trumpet, and I knew the harmony, and I knew the forms and melodies. But so anyway, I did the bass gig that night, and um, one finger bass on the left hand. Oh wow! And but what blew me away was he called me back and said, "Do you want to do the gig steady?" After the one finger thing, yeah, it was like because I had a groove. Oh right, <laughs> right. As long I as grooved. you know the pocket. Yep, that's right. And it was <laughs> all about the groove, right. and that, and so that was the beginning of it. And then. Um, to make a long story even shorter, I <laughs> gradually did more and more gigs on bass and became more in demand on bass than I was in trumpet. And I switched my major to bass. Okay. And I studied acoustic bass with a great um, oh, okay, I didn't know that classical player Lucas Drew. He wow. was the principal bassist in the Miami Philharmonic. And um, so, a lot of what I do on fretless bass mm -hmm. is really a hybrid from acoustic bass because I really studied um, and was an acoustic player. Oh, okay. When I came to New York, I was playing acoustic oh, bass and, and going all around. I've actually done some recordings on acoustic. Oh, see, I didn't know this. Yep. Yeah. And, um, but when I, I came to New York and I was playing acoustic bass, and um, I had was playing at a club up in Nyack, New York, and Pat Metheny, who I had gone to school with in Miami, came and played, and we played together. I was playing acoustic, and he said we got together at that point, but in a little bit later, um, when we started the Pat Metheny group oh. in 1976, um, there was no room in the van for an upright bass. <laughs> right. So I, I and played electric. And don't go electric. to that story yet because I got, I'm going to ask yes. you about that one. <laughs> but anyway, that's um, a, a lot of the, uh, you know, how I got into fretless and everything. A lot of it comes from the melodicness of trumpet and the sensibility of acoustic bass and the sound of acoustic bass. And the reason I was so attracted to fretless was because it was very versatile. I could play in a lot of different areas not only acoustic areas but electric areas but still have that droney sound yeah, and i love that yeah, sound so that kind of warmth yes that uh, so you you just you just kind of transition to the fretless because you're you're acoustic playing and you wanted something that was more portable but also very versatile exactly yeah yep. wow wow that is really cool and i still <laughs> play upright i usually play every day it's the first thing i do really yeah i, I start never, walking i, I just <laughs> I just start playing walking bass lines because I love the sound of it, you know. Wow. So, yeah. I never knew that, Mark, ever. Hmm? That's so amazing. Um, now, uh, wow, I'm like kind of, you know, I, I have my little script here following, and I'm, because I try to, I'm trying to teach myself how to play bass, and oh. all I get is people telling me, um, here, here's $20, please don't play. Yeah. So <laughs> they pay me not to play. But um, now, uh, not not too long ago we were all backstage mm -hmm. and uh actually you and michael were kind of uh talking about the good old days and uh and and one of the things that i realize with people uh, especially with musicians uh they'll read bios online like you know they'll read yours for instance mm -hmm. and uh and they'll think um that your career because you were mentioning earlier um all the things involved but they think that your career has been this uninterrupted continuation of like easy life and recognition and I mean I've even fallen prey to that kind of thinking because you know you 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 never really see what's behind the prolific right uh, bio of a story of mm -hmm. someone and uh, and the story you told in the dressing room um, really put a handle on the amount of time uh, and the life choices we make when we are you know, seduced really. Um, uh oh, what into story did I tell? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to keep it tame. Oh. Into, <laughs> into the life of being a musician. You know, you, I think mm -hmm. it really is a seduction. You, it, you somehow or another, it pulls you in, and and you just can't help yourself. You just can't help yourself. Now, I'm referring to, and mm -hmm. you'd mentioned it in uh, just a minute ago, uh, the van story, and um, you were talking about the early days being on the road and the van and right. <laughs> you've got to tell us you have to share the story with us <laughs> about being in the van you know that that kind of you, you how many days on the road and sure. just all of it i mean yeah well when we started when pat Matheny started the pat Matheny group his father was a dodge dealer car dealer oh, okay in um lee summit missouri so uh pat bought a big van it had four bucket seats and we all had <laughs> a specific seat 
And the only way at that time to really, because you have to understand when the Pat Metheny group started, no one knew who Pat was. He oh. had done w uh, two records on ECM, the ECM record label. Okay. One was called Bright Size Life with Jaco Pastorius, and another one was called, um, I can't think of the next one, but it was uh, Everhart Weber oh, was okay. the. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Was the basis. Uh, so anyway, pa in the jazz underground contemporary jazz world, Pat was getting some notoriety. And he was a teacher at Berkeley with Gary Burton up there and played in Gary Burton's group, but by no means had the uh, the notoriety that the band came to. So we started out in the van, and you know we were playing seventy five dollar a night gigs, traveling all around, and we traveled probably I, when I was with the band. 300 days a year for four years and the first two years were in the van <laughs> and we would drive everywhere all over the United States you know and we would open up for some great people Jean-Luc Ponty wow. and it was a, there's a classic story because we played in Vermont and then we drove all the way to San Francisco mm -hmm. and then we drove back to, to Quebec City all straight maybe oh. with one gig in the middle and coming back and the way we did it was everyone drove a okay. tank of yeah. gas I was just oh a tank of gas because I was getting ready to ask you right. did people take turns yeah we took turns and I was just telling my wife Connie the other day that um, it was nice then because on the radio they had these uh, the craft hour yes uh, plays yes, radio yes, yes. books or whatever yeah, but with actors great. and so yeah yeah so it's I remember <laughs> tuning in late at night in a <laughs> snowstorm and listening to oh, those that's so great <laughs> <laughs> uh, but so we we packed our own gear in and we carried uh, amps and we used acoustic piano wherever, but we brought our own drums and we had exact, Lyle Mays, the pianist, had an exact way of packing the vans and then on top of everything we had a mattress so you could sleep in the back. Oh, okay. But you only, there was about four <laughs> inches above your head. <laughs> so you had to like watch out. in a coffin or something. Yes. <laughs> But that was the only way to do it then because you couldn't afford to fly yeah. everywhere because That's the band right. wasn't known. Right. And, um, you know, Pat was able to buy this van and, and do it, and gas wasn't expensive. Right. That's right. Hotel. Th it was different worlds. Completely. Because when you say a, a gallon of gas, right. well, you were, what, driving three or four hours? <laughs> like <laughs> Exactly. And so I mean, it, was, you know, it was possible <laughs> to do it. And, and yeah. Because of that, uh, being in a close environment like that, the band really grew as a band, yeah. you know, and yeah. it was a very cohesive and very um, dynamic band. Mm -hmm. And um, it's rare to have a group that stays together that long. That's true. And th that is that's so tight. And it, you know, it established a a different sort of sound compared to what was happening at the time, which was at that time fusion was sort of on the wane, and um, it was ready for some different orchestration you right, know and that's right. what uh pat and lyle especially with the uh, the way that they orchestrated the band and wow but we played together as a unit and we traveled as a unit and after the second year we started to fly a little more and after the f the quote-unquote white album right, the right. Matheny <laughs> group album <laughs> right. came out that was very successful yeah. and got a lot of airplay and it allowed us to be fly sometimes and so it ended up uh, by the third year we had a couple of semi trucks and we flew oh, okay. and the guys would come so but we were flying and you know I didn't know what city we were in half the time it was just so intense but wow 300 days out of a, a year yeah four years that's a lot that's as hard as you can that possibly as hard as hit you it you can possibly get I that's think. seriously paying your dues yeah you know so when people look at this and they look at your story or Pat Metheny or you know and they just read it's now no longer just about Oh, you know they you you won the these Grammys and platinum records. Mm -hmm. They get to to really understand just how much work and and dedications involved in just uh, create because you guys were also part of creating and building a whole new genre or sound moving out of jazz. Right. You know, so that's yep. why you know I can't even imagine not knowing you know who you were, who you are, or Pat Metheny is. Do you know what I mean? We mm -hmm. never think that, uh, we always just see people as famous. Right. But we never think that, you know, we're sitting with them uh, in a club, or we sit in with them at a club, and, you know, mm. nobody knows who they are. Nobody knows who, and, and you're sitting next to them, yeah. and the next thing you know. I'm al always interested to find out how people got to where they are in all walks of life. Yeah. You know. Yeah, same here. Success stories of people, you know, and um, 
it was interesting with the Pat Metheny group because when Pat called me to come and sort of try out for the band in Boston, I was playing with David Sanborn. I was oh, a yes. member of the David Sanborn right, band. That's right. And yes. I was in New York, and we had done a record with David on Warner Brothers, and we recorded one of my songs, and we were traveling and touring with David. And that was a very prestigious New York scene because if you played in that band, you were sort of a wow. first call session player, which Absolutely. I was, am. And, um, but Pat called and I said, well, I'm playing with David, you know, and I really like this. He said, well, why don't you come up and we'll just play. And so I went up and we played and I really thought that this was really special. And, yeah. and the whole reason, you know, when I went to school to study music and everything, I wanted to play creative music, which isn't to say that David Sanborn wasn't creative, mm. but this with Pat, it was something different and I really wanted to go for it. So that was a a real big leap of faith for me wow. because I could have stayed and been very successful mm -hmm. just doing the New York scene and right, right. studio work but I I wanted to play more um, original music and, and creative music and again not that David isn't creative David's an amazing musician right right but I understand what you're saying it's 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 actually when your heart tells you something Mm -hmm. And you and but all of the the physical evidence is saying, you know, like a lot of people say, man, you know, you don't want to you know, burn that bridge or you don't want to get rid of that because that's already there. But then when the heart speaks to us in certain ways, we know that there is all this other possibility of growth. Right. Of 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 us moving toward our own, mm -hmm. you know, and yeah. that that's actually a b beautiful story. I yeah. Mean, you know, it's it, we we have to make these choices, these right. life choices. So from making that choice, yeah. I went from traveling around with David Sanborn and having roadies and everything yeah. to now talking okay. to Pat and Pat calling me in New York because I was living in New York and saying, "Okay, take a bus up to Newburgh, and we're going to be coming from Boston on eighty four, and we'll meet you in Newburgh at the bus station." <laughs> oh, I said, "Okay, great." God went up to Penn Station uh, or whatever Port Authority got the bus right. went up there. Yeah, well that's still like that for us. I mean for for our my band, you know, we we, yeah. we have to pile everything into the Subaru. Sure, and, you, and you, you just want to play, you know. But you want to play with right. people and it's not it's not just about um you know whether they have a name. It's it's some there's a connection there that really you really want to connect to and you want to play with you know? right exactly so that you don't care you really don't care right yeah so that's really <laughs> that's great now um okay so let's go into the parts what are you working on right now you you have your own studio you have a mm -hmm. record label wave tone records um is there like something right now that you're uh, you were telling me something about this incredible um chanting with um krishna das. krishna yes. yes yes well that's a i just this last week, Monday and Tuesday of this week, um, it's now Saturday. Um, <laughs> Is it? <laughs> <laughs> and we're going to play tonight in Las Vegas. Right, we have yeah. sound check in a couple hours. <laughs> um, I did a, a recording um, with a chanting, uh, what's a chanting man? A, uh, a religious. A can not a cantor, because no. cantors are used in, 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 um, in Christian. Uh, I, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, uh, but it was great. It was in New York, and it was with uh, uh -oh. a tabla player and a percussionist and a chime player. And Krishna Das plays harmonium, which is like a little pump organ that mm -hmm. you pump with one hand and you play. And he's written um, very simple chord changes, um, all triad, major, mm -hmm. minor, to these Indian uh, Vedic chants from India. Wow. Um, that were inspired by his guru at the time. Same person, uh, Baba Ram Das, mm -hmm. who wrote the book Be Here Now, which yeah. I was a big fan of in 1969. Wow. And Das was with him then, mm -hmm. um, and his guru is Maharaji. And um, So anyway, he um, now has a very big following in the yoga world, in the, um, I would say, yeah, yoga world. Um, and he goes and does these chants and plays. And we did a record for him this week, which was a great project. Uh, we were at Avatar Studios in New York for two days, about okay. 16 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Wow. With a choir in another room. Awesome. And so it was call and response. And um, he was singing these these pr these uh, Indian prayers, and they sing back. And, wow. and just by singing these, supposedly, it, it brings, you know, the spirit of, God, yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah that to energy, to that the people. So yeah, that's right. I'm sort of a hired gunman. <laughs> 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 uh, 
that's so against what that's all about. I but know, it's just like I, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm I'm not really a follower of Maharishi, but I love being in that environment and um <laughs> and I, I and it's it's great. And I play with him from time to time in the New York area and it's like it's such a great uh, great experience. So I just did that and yeah. Um, but you mentioned I do have a studio mm -hmm. and I have a record company that I've had since 1993 right. called Wave Tone Records. Mm -hmm. So, wow. Yeah, that's, that's 20 years? Yeah, Is I know. Is it 20 it years or 30 years? 20. It's 20 years. Wow. Because yeah, I started with Michael in 93. Wow. So, but that's a long time. Yeah. And, you know, you keep, whenever you mention it, you mention it as if it's, you know, I just started this label. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but I f right now I have about 16 releases on it, mostly my own things. And I start it started uh, from some live recordings I had of the group Elements that I co-lead with Danny Gottlieb. Yeah. And I wanted to get them out. And uh, it was they had already been recorded live. So it was, uh, from a financial point of view, it was very um, feasible to do. And that just one thing led to another. And now I've been doing all my solo records on the label and selling them digitally and now you know especially now digitally and yeah, but yeah. i'm working on a new record which is a trio that i did with danny gottlieb the mm -hmm. drummer and mitch foreman keyboards oh okay and i'm gonna be releasing that in the spring of 2014 oh okay so, so you I'm guys are have you gone into the studio now to start it or you just it's we went in the studio it's uh, the tracks are all done we recorded about oh. 19 tracks oh, which okay. all of them will make the record and i'm uh post producing it now Wow! just uh editing and cleaning things up and then when i get back uh from our japan tour with michael mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh in early november i'm gonna start mixing so wow you're so busy yeah i, I love being in the moment yeah. of the music yeah. i just that's and i know you do too and that's whatever i just mm -hmm. like being in that place and yeah and you can tell you can tell whenever you you know i'm watching you or i'm listening to you on stage especially watching because i think in looking at musicians when they're playing says a lot about what they're feeling you know if they're really there yes you know you'll be looking at some of the different you know like the cats over at willard or charles or you know mm -hmm. whoever you're playing with and you're smiling and you know you know you've got that look on your face of the serenity happening I it's really inspiring to watch oh that's great you know because it makes me get more even want to connect more to what's going on yes as opposed to cats that you know uh, you know, you know that you know those right. ones that are just waiting for you to finish <laughs> right. so they can solo and and you know. Well, what I've become aware of is is the now, you know, yes. and and the the beauty of what's happening. And when you're with great musicians like you and Charles and and the whole band, oh, thank you. <laughs> you know, I want to be in that moment. I want to just be right and reacting to what they're doing and and Michael and and you know try yeah. to make it go somewhere because. Well, Why you do. not? You make it go. I mean, you really <laughs> <I> do. <know>. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely do. I hope it do. goes to the right place, but <laughs> something. Absolutely. You know, always there in the pocket, in the present. It's great. Now, this is my, uh, mm -hmm. okay, so now are you ready to go into the basement with me? Because this is the part of the show where uh, it's my sure. favorite part. And I always use that line. But you gave me a look like, what What do you mean? Do we have to go the into basement. the basement? <laughs> 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 no, we're not going to really really go to the basement here in, in this hotel in, in Vegas, but this is the basement of our, our deep psyche. Sure. Uh, okay, so now, the first question is, tell us about someone you've worked with who is a little frightening to you, but in a good way. Hmm. There's a couple, there's probably a lot of experiences <laughs> like that. Um, Uh, one that comes to mind was a record that I did with a great uh, saxophone player, Steve Grossman. Okay. Yeah. He used to play with Miles Davis. Yeah, yeah. And um, he's very intense, and sometimes, w you know, will come out would come out and say things that he doesn't hold back. Okay. <laughs> but he's a, such an intense and great player. Um, so that was for me. I this record was called. Um, trying to think what the name of it is i can't remember see it's getting to be that age yeah well you well, you're on like actually you said you're on every album ever made oh so God, how do you no, remember no, no. how do you remember it, all of them i mean you know it's prolific uh but <laughs> it was that was kind of a scary thing playing with him because i was i didn't want to make a mistake and uh but there are other experiences as well uh-huh and this is sort of 
indirectly playing with someone, but I played with the Gil Evans Orchestra for many years, okay. which was an amazing yeah. experience. Yeah. Uh, and Charles Blenzik also yeah. got to play with, with mm -hmm. Gil. And um, we used to play at this club in New York, which doesn't exist anymore, Sweet Basil. It's yes. on 7th Avenue, right yeah. near Bleecker Street. I used to do brunches there, play br oh. sing brunches there with uh, Great. Eddie Chambly and uh, Doc Cheatham. Nice. Yeah, those old, old time guys. Yes, I remember <laughs> that. Yep. And we used to play every Monday night, the Monday Night Orchestra. And um, it was always great playing with Gil. And I was never really that intimidated being around Gil. It was more of a, a fellowship. It was just a great, great experience. But one night, Miles Davis came and was oh. in the audience, came to listen to Gil. So oh. it's a small club, you yes, know? Yes. And I've always been in awe of Miles Davis and always wanted to play with Miles and the closest I got to playing with Miles was being on the road with Gil and Miles in a co-billing okay. where Gil Evans Orchestra opened for Miles and that was a great experience wow. you know <laughs> we toured in the States and in Japan and Europe with that configuration but this one time <laughs> when Miles came in I was just so self-conscious <laughs> of my playing that I, I I was beside myself I didn't you know I just oh I didn't know what to do, but <laughs> but to top it off, a lot of times special guests would come in, and that night in the trumpet section, Chuck Mangione sat in. Oh, okay. So, you know, Chuck's a very good yeah, player yeah, yeah. in his yeah, own right and yeah, has right. had much success. Right, right. You know, um, and but he came in and started to sort of boss the rhythm section around. Oh, wow. And you don't do that no. with anybody. No. And not with the Gil Evans <laughs> Orchestra <laughs> because we were, we were just you know when that band started we were just you have to remember there's probably twelve soloists so the rhythm section is always you know right. waiting to find what the the direction's going to be and going for it and right, and we're true. gone on to the next thing, so Miles is right in the front row oh. and Chuck me and I'm sing I'm thinking to myself of all nights, <laughs> of all nights, I got. <laughs> this on my left and Miles right in front of me and you know and nothing against Chuck Mangione. No, no, I, don't I, I I don't like to speak badly about anyone <laughs> no, because no, it's not. I but it was it. it was a combination of you know being freaked out that Miles was there <laughs> and and then being boss by but I just <laughs> said basically I, I I think Adam Nussbaum was playing. Okay. I just looked at Adam. I just shook my <laughs> head. And I said, uh uh. And we just plowed through it, you know, right. and it, it turned out to be good, but it was kind of was a weird night. Wow, that would be terrifying. I mean, yeah. really, because, you know, it's it's like having, if I'm out and, and uh, all the great singers that I really, really respect, and a lot of them, are, they're all dead, really, but mm -hmm. um, there's like Diane Reeves, for instance, if right. I'm singing. And, sure. Uh, you know, and she comes in and she's sitting there, you know, I just, uh, 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 you know, I mean, I had problems singing with Michael because, you know. Sure. <laughs> so I can understand. It's better incredible. not to know who's out there and yeah, just assume just that it could be the anybody that of your highest yes. dream, you know. And then <laughs> exactly. And you'll play good. <laughs> right, right. Or it's probably better just to think of them as all second graders that are on a school trip out there right. in the audience. That way you, can, you just can focus on whatever. Exactly. You, you know, or not think it. about anything and then just the music. That right. would be the best. <laughs> right, right. Be here now, right? Right. Be there now. So, but, okay. You know, what – um. But it, sort of the back end of that story was a, a good friend of mine was dating Miles Davis. Oh. She lived above me. Ah, that's and she was in Japan with Miles one time. And at the time, I was uh, recording and writing music for CNN. Oh, yeah. I produced some music uh, for Headline News. Right. The right. weather, that's when right. they had the weather right. thing. Mm -hmm. And so I produced that in Nashville and played on it. And it featured the bass, yeah. fretless bass. <laughs> it was, and this is really was so rewarding to me because... Uh, my friend said, you know, I was with Miles in Japan and we were in the hotel room and we were just, you know, watching f headline news. Mm -hmm. And Miles said, hey, I won't say her name because I don't want to. Right, right, right. Private. <laughs> hey, hey, honey, that's Mark. Oh, wow. He recognized my sound. And that was wow. such a compliment to me. Yeah. You know, that's, you know, oh. just made it for me <sighs> that he would know who I was. Yeah. You know, that was. That was a big deal for me. So, I mean, that's the ultimate. I mean, that's yeah. actually why we do it is is to actually 
be identified by, you know, when we play, like when if I'm singing, you know it's Veronica. Or when you're playing the right. bass, you know it's Mark. Right, you know, so the Mark voice Egan. came through. Exactly. And with Miles, you always knew it was Miles. I mean, there's a lot of people that right. copied him. Now, he might not have liked my voice, <laughs> but he said, that's <laughs> my <laughs> But he knows it's you. No, man, hey, that's hun, great. That's Mark. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody uh, has their imitations too. So it was a good, <laughs> you know, comeback after the after the scary <laughs> after the scary thing, you know. Wow. So it was that's cool. That's a great story. Yeah. Wow. So okay, um, okay. So the second s- the second question is, now what is the scariest work in any medium? You know, example like painting, photograph, book, movie, television show, radio broadcast, whatever mm. that you've encountered. The scariest, you know, what comes to mind is when I first saw the movie The Exorcist. That freaked me out. (laughs) It really (laughs) seemed real to me, (laughs) and it scared me. And I don't really like horror movies. I don't want to see the dark side like in movies. I'm not interested because there's enough going on in my head, you know, in dreams (laughs) and things. (laughs) <laughs> every day but and that movie still to this day um is scary to me and and at the time it was out it was pretty advanced yes. for scary movies yes, it was. without being hokey mm-hmm. it was it was kind of it had another element to it that you know was made you otherworldly or something yeah. so they used this the 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 tech the techniques that like when she comes down the stairs bat bit you know backwards like a back bend yes and the, you know i mean like just really weird things like that that they they show m- more of the the visual things of possession yes we kind of just maybe Im- i never even imagined it you mm. know like that's why Exorcist is so. Uh, did you ever read the book? Did you have a chance to read? I the book? I didn't read the book. I probably yeah. should, but the I don't book want to know. Really, really scary. And then when they made the movie, it was just okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I better not read the book then. <laughs> no, no, don't read the book. No, no, I would think. Uh, no, no, don't. Read <laughs> well, <laughs> so yeah, I would say that was probably a a, a scary thing that stands out in oh, my mind. Oh yeah. Oh wow, that's a good one. That's a really good one. I like. Uh, I like that one. Uh, now, the last question. Mm-hmm. And um, and this one is, what is the scariest thing that has ever happened to you while performing live? Now, scary could be many things. It could be m- many. Yeah, you know, like um, I think Jacques in the last show fell off the stage or something, and he had to. I think a solo coming up, whatever. You know, it could be anything. Right. <laughs> it could be. <laughs> you know, there's been some, sc- a lot of scary moments. So <laughs> I might I have know, to. Because you played on every album. Oh, uh, not every album, but I, you know, one that the first one I think that comes to mind is I played with the um, Manhattan Transfer. Okay. Um, and I this was in 2000. In the year 2000, we played the Red Sea Jazz Festival. Okay. Well Have you played at it? No, it's in no. Israel. It's in Eilat. It's oh, on yeah. the Red Sea. Oh, wow. And yeah, it's in the right. summertime, and it's about 150 <laughs> degrees. It's like <laughs> being in an oven all the time. <laughs> you have to drink at least eight huge bottles of water wow. to just stay sort of wow. regular. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, it was sold out, and it was a big outdoor f- venue, and it was all the stages were sort of made out of these big freight containers that separated the that made a a big theater type thing and we're up in a big stage and we're getting just about ready to play they were counting off the downbeat of it and all my music blew away oh. <laughs> it blew into the audience <laughs> like confetti <laughs> and i was panicked because i didn't know the music that well I've, i'd only done a few gigs with them and they were already counting off the <laughs> intro to the song, uh, Route 66, right, right, and it right, starts right. off with a bass solo <laughs> with voice. Uh, luckily, it was a blues, you know, 66. You know, usually I played upright with them, but in this case, there was the upright they had at the Red Sea was like a, an ancient <laughs> scroll. It would have, like it had been buried in the <laughs> sand for a thousand right, years. It's so hot there, too. Oh, so. the, the action was about four <laughs> inches off the neck, and I said, I can't do it. I just, I'm not going to, I can't play it. So I, anyway, it happened. I was playing Route 66, but at the same time, I was looking around. So I ended up having to, there's, 
it starts out with the blues, but then it goes into a series of syncopated hits along mm -hmm. with the horn section. Mm -hmm. So I had to go over and read off the tenor player's chart, wow. which is a transposed instrument, yes. which is up a whole step. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so I had to transpose down a whole step, but not read his notes, transpose his chords down and try to read his... So it was, it was awful. Oh, my God. Then the one of the singers who's the leader, I won't mention the name, said, you know, for the next song we're going to do this. And I said, wait a minute, i got to get this music. He goes, come on, you know, and started coming down on me. Oh. And I freaked out. Oh, wow. I just... Wow. I gave him a glare that said, look, I, there's nothing I can do here. I don't have any music. I don't know the music. Don't come down on me. Right, it's the right. wind. You know, I, meanwhile... I had clothespins. I had if I had about fifty clothespins <laughs> around the whole book. It was really windy because of the hot desert air, you know. So that was scary. It was just, and then after I really, I, I just, you know, they we talked after, and I was really bugged. I yeah. just I didn't like the way that they handled me. I don't, you know. Yeah, yeah, and they didn't see the, I mean, see the music flying. Not, I guess not. I guess well, not. Just not. And you know, that's kind of a strange thing because. I can't imagine being on stage with everybody and not see what's going on. I mean, you got to be participating. Right. Exactly. You know I mean? well, what's the point of? But being that was the scary. That you know, because you're revved <laughs> up to play. You know how yeah. it is when you're about to yeah, perform. You're yeah. very Already. much. You know, you're ready to run. You know, yeah. and, and so <laughs> yeah, I was. Your heart is going. You know, being really fast. And, you but know. a similar thing happened. You know, it's. I guess these scary things in music happen where. It, Another thing was I was playing with a big band in the WDR big band of Cologne. Okay. And we were at um, a big concert hall for Audi. And, oh, okay. And um, it was a live radio broadcast, of course. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I had, I had three music stands because this was big charts. And we're going on playing, and one of my pages got stuck together. So <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, I went from page two to page four. No, one, two, three, to page five. Oh, wow. So I was in the wrong place. I was so lost, but I, I played it with conviction. <laughs> Big <laughs> conviction. <laughs> and it was, I thought the whole band was off. I said, I can't be off. I'm, I'm, I was so into it. <laughs> Finally, I just stopped playing, and I realized what happened. And so to all you musicians out there, who are listening, you know, just if you're doing a show and you have, you're reading and you have pages, just triple check that all the pages are open. <laughs> so it was awful. And it was, you know, recorded. <laughs> and no one knows that when they're sitting home, you know, in Bavaria or wherever. No, and, and they he, mm, uh, uh. <laughs> it's awful. I oh, know, that's amazing. That's amazing. So, you know, when you think about because you have so many incredible stories. Um, in in looking back, like now, mm -hmm. for instance, if that were to happen to you, like, you know, today or tonight. Right. But you know the music in, oh, inside. I would say it was something that you were doing that was kind of new and, and it happened to you now. Right. Would you have the, you know, the same, I mean, your approach to this? Because usually fear is supposed to either make us go more... <laughs> into yes. restriction or it, it liberates us. Well, it's know, still we angsty, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, it, you know, actually it happened last time we played in Detroit. I didn't know we were going to play Antonio's song, which is an encore song. Oh, yeah. Well, it was yeah. another encore that we wasn't... Yeah, it, right it just happened. Yeah. <laughs> I had already unplugged, oh. and I didn't have Antonio's chart in front of me, so I was scrambling. The song already started. I was <laughs> scrambling to plug in. I couldn't find the chart, so I played it by ear. Right. Which I I knew, but I didn't remember the piano solo. I know it now. Right, right, right. Exactly. So you know, it's all learning experience, and you know, oh. things happen. Yeah. And you you just try to jump in and make it good. You know, I remember, I remember in elementary school, I was in the pit band uh, every Friday. They had assemblies, and I was playing trumpet in the l at, for the assembly. I remember a guitar player played a solo guitar thing up on stage, mm -hmm. and it always stuck out to me. Um, because he was playing solo guitar. We were down playing when everybody came in. And in the middle of it, he messed up a note and he just stopped and he he lost it. And he, could, <laughs> he, tried, to, he tried to go back <laughs> and play and he couldn't do anything. And, and I he said to like myself, frozen? he was frozen. I just oh. said, go on, keep playing. Even then I said, oh. what? you know, I noticed, I said, don't do that. Just, yeah. <laughs> just 
play. <laughs> Conviction. <laughs> People won't remember. <laughs> right, they won't. Just keep it going. That's true. But he stopped and he went back to the beginning of the tune. And he got to that place again and he stumbled and he went oh, back. So he kept going back. He kept going oh. back. <laughs> <laughs> no. So that was a big thing to me. I said, oh, I will never do that. Oh, no, <laughs> right. Just keep right. playing even... Yeah, you just keep, you just go, just keep going, right? And you know, at some point, you'll Lay find out, out where. <laughs> right? Hopefully, there'll be some, you know. Right. And I'm not knocking tenor players, but you know, somebody who'll solo for a long period of time. Exactly. And Take then it you'll over. You'll get to go and find and you know where you are in, in the charts and everything. Yeah. So. Okay. <laughs> wow. Now, uh, okay. So you got you have another one. You have another story for us too, right? A scary, scary playing thing. story. Oh, okay, yes. cool. I want to let's hear it. <laughs> um, it was in the early uh, mid seventies with the Pat Metheny group when we were playing in Pat's hometown of uh, Lee Summit, Missouri, and there was a place called the River Key, which is a song that Pat wrote. And what the the key is? It's a uh, one of those flood river. Uh, it looks like when you go by it in the day. T uh, normally, there's no water in it, maybe a little trickling. Oh, but yeah, when there's yeah. storms and stuff, yeah, it just. It's a runoff, yeah, yeah. and it was right near a big uh, shopping mall and area, and it's called the River Key. And we played in the actual b river. They uh, put a, st a <laughs> bandstand down there so that people could watch from the bridge and everything. Really? Yes. So we were playing, you know, da -da 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 -da. <laughs> and we might have played the first song. I think the head of... of a and R from Warner Brothers was there because they always sent reps out with us. We were on Warner Brothers through ECM; they were distributed there. Okay. And um, there was a guy there who traveled with us on the road, and so he was there down by the stage. And anyway, off in the distance, the clouds get very dark. Uh oh. Very dark. Yeah. <laughs> and the, it's one of those really fast-moving Midwest storms yeah. blew in. It was a thunderstorm. And it started raining like crazy. <laughs> and before we knew it, water was up to our waist. No. I was holding my base N over my no head way. with water up to my waist. And I thought I was going to go. Oh I thought I was going down God. stream. <laughs> I thought it was going what? down the river. <gasps> and I just held the – I was just worried about my base. <laughs> right. I, I could swim. Being electrocuted. I had unplugged. Yeah. Oh, uh, but <laughs> <laughs> but there, was a lot of, there were a lot of amps on stage. And it was all underwater, right? Yeah. I mean, it's just yes. And I, I ran with, you know, oh up with water up to my waist to the side of the bank, which with is muddy. Right, with the base yeah, over Yeah, and the <laughs> Warner Brothers guy just helped pulling me up. And I just, that was very I, scary. That was life-threatening. That was a life-threatener. Yeah, that, that is more, and well, uh, audience, what, were, what was the audience doing? Were they? Everybody was running. Well, because it was a horrible thunderstorm, right? right? And it was a real surge. It was a water, it was like a. Oh. <laughs> it was like a tsunami oh was coming God, down the river. That's like so unbelievable. Uh, that was now that, that was, to me would be that was scary. scary. Yeah, that the, every, the sheet anybody. music flying is one thing, and it's <laughs> you know you make do, but this was really scary. So wow. I'm glad that I could share that with you. No, I you know what, and I that that's the best one. That's the topper there, and I just want to thank you again thank you. for being on the show. Thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I'll see you later on tonight. Great, on Veronica. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Okay. okay. That's it for Tales from the Jazz Side. The Jazz Side is always there waiting for us to enter and waiting to enter us. So, until next time, unplug your ear holes for you never know what worlds may be waiting for you. <laughs>